uh, we ran out of time before I could uh, uh, finish it, fin finish addressing the last of the important topics, which is um, the concept of clearing the neighborhood. Um, and so, uh, so, so this is the uh, phrase that that is new, that has been added uh, in 2006 by International Astronomical Union um, in order to resolve a um, crisis of a definition that has come up that I'll talk about in a couple minutes. So they introduced the concept, the idea of clearing the neighborhood in order to separate Pluto from the major planet. And even before 2006, Pluto was a bit of an oddball of the um, of the uh, the planet beyond the asteroid belt. Pluto was the only planet that wasn't a giant. It wasn't a gas or ice giant, and, um, and so it was it was quite small. It really didn't quite fit the mold. But you know, it when it was discovered, uh, um, it. People thought it was the uh, either the planet X that they were looking for, or um, something else. So, um, so it was uh, included as part of the planet. But a discovery made it, uh, I think, in two thousand five, uh, necessitated this um, um, this separation that um, the objects in the category of Pluto shouldn't really be counted among the other major planets. And the criteria criterion that they came up with, which would separate up Pluto from the major planets without um, without <laughs> making <laughs> without demoting any of the other major planets as something other than a planet, they um, they added this this criteria that for something to be classified as a major planet, it must have cleared its neighborhood or clear the neighborhood around its orbit. And what it means is that um, in its orbit, that planetary, that planet is the only object that is gravitationally dominant in the, in the neighborhood, <laughs> in the area or the distance around its orbit. Um, and there is a way this happens when a planet is large enough through its gravitational interaction with uh, any other objects that are in a similar orbit, it'll do one of these three things if it's large enough. And when it is not large enough, that's when um, that's when it doesn't become a. It does. It fails to do one of these three things, and it doesn't. It's not a planet. It's a dwarf planet. So, so. I wanted to show you this uh, picture of some of the major objects in our solar system, so that um, so that you can see what we mean by clearing the neighborhood. This is an image from chapter seven, and I thought I put this in one of the lecture slides, but I had trouble finding it. So, <laughs> but it's a figure seven point three. You can find it in the textbook, chapter seven. It's uh, an illustration of our solar system with some of the biggest uh, uh, objects, um, the major planets and some of the, uh, I guess the, uh, all the objects that are illustrated here are dwarf planets. So um, yeah, with some of the uh, larger objects in the solar system, you can see the sun there. I don't know if it's uh, drawn to scale, it might be. There's a possibility it's not, I'm not sure. Some might be drawn larger than it actually is. Um, and you, in any case, there's the sun and you see the orbit of the four uh, terrestrial planets. Mercury, the barely visible, almost looks like ears of the sun and uh, orbit of uh, Venus. And then this is the orbit of earth and Mars is at, um, this doesn't look like Mars. I don't think a Mars is at double the, maybe it is at double. I thought it was at 1.5 AU from Sun. Anyways, Mars orbit is somewhere here. Uh, so these uh, are the four terrestrial planets. It's um, compared to the orbital distance of the other um, 
other four major planets and the dwarf planets. These are quite small portion of the solar system. And within each of these uh, orbits, um, Earth is the gravitationally dominant object in the Earth orbit. There's no other significantly large object like an asteroid or, or um, well, like an asteroid or something. Um, there's nothing else that has a stable orbit that has the same orbital size as the Earth. There are other near Earth objects, but they are not really in a stationary orbit. They are either in a highly elliptical orbit or um, they are in an orbit where they will eventually get destabilized and be pushed onto something else. Um, as in there are uh, small objects near Earth orbit and we expect one of these three things will happen to those objects over geological time scale. Now, uh, and we have this uh, asteroid belt. So this uh, figure has a Ceres labeled and <laughs> that uh, uh, Ceres is the only object that is in the asteroid belt that's large enough to qualify as a dwarf planet. So you have to imagine an asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, where there's the largest collection of uh, small solar system bodies. And here's Jupiter. And there are quite a few objects that, um, that are moving in connection to Jupiter. So there are, um, so if you look at the slides for the asteroids, I think I highlight some of the asteroid groups. Uh, maybe here, yeah. You can see some of the asteroid groups that around the Jupiter. There are the Trojans, Greeks, and Hildas. And all these objects, they are gravitationally influenced by Jupiter. So even though there are objects in the orbit of Jupiter, that doesn't make Jupiter not a planet anymore because Jupiter gravitationally dominates how these objects uh, move around. That satisfies one of the uh, categories of uh, uh, things that should have happened for a planet to clear its neighborhood, as in uh, uh, capture them into an orbit around itself or into a resonant orbit. So this, uh, uh, these uh, Trojans, Greeks, um, Hildas, those asteroids are in an orbit that is resonant with the Jupiter's orbit. So in that sense, Jupiter has cleared um, at the neighborhood around its orbit. There isn't an, another planet that uh, you know just trailing Jupiter. Something like that isn't happening because Jupiter is so large so gravitationally dominant that if something is in some neighborhood of Jupiter, it'll have to over geological time scale, it'll have to reach some kind of stable arrangement. And that only stable arrangement that's possible is either being captured into Jupiter or into orbit around it, or uh, uh, being in a, a resonant orbit. It's called like Lagrange point, but let me not <laughs> go too into that. And uh, something like that happens with all these major planets, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, Uranus, and Neptune. And up until around 2005, um, when people discovered the Pluto, one of the first trans-Neptunian object, as an object beyond the Neptune, to be discovered. Um, for a long time, Pluto was the only object around that orbit. Uh, on orbit slightly below, uh, uh, um, slightly beyond the Neptune for most of the time. I think Pluto's orbit is elliptical enough that sometimes it is inside the Neptune's orbit. But you know, it's an orbit that's different from Neptune. Um, it's so it was ninth planet for a while, and um, there was a mnemonic that people <laughs> you might have learned this new mnemonic as a way to memorize the planets in the solar system. Uh, the one I learned was my very excellent mother just uh, served us nine pizzas. <laughs> what gave a uh, difficulty in maintaining the status quo in 2005, 2006 
was the discovery of Eris, another trans-Neptunian object. And um, Eris is quite similar to Pluto. It's uh, similar to Pluto in size. It's uh, similar to Pluto in orbit. You know, it's kind of elliptical um, at a, with a orbit at an angle, uh, an angle to the, the plane of the solar system, the ecliptic plane. And, um, and Pluto and Eris being similar, that poses uh, this uh, dilemma. Either both Pluto and Eris are planets, or neither of them are. It, 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 uh, um, <laughs> if uh, it's not one or the other, if a Pluto is a planet, but somehow Eris isn't, then, um, then it's just completely arbitrary <laughs> because Pluto would be planet just because it was discovered earlier. And you know, that kind of arbitrary thing happens all the time in, in real life, happens all the time in history. But in science, we try not to be arbitrary when we can avoid it. So, so that was the dilemma um, that, so I guess one way of resolving that dilemma would have been, okay, let's make Aries a planet, that's our 10th planet, and we'll come up with some other mnemonic device. But then there are other, many other trans-Neptunian objects that are maybe not as big as Aries or Pluto, but, um, but are um, still in similar orbit and maybe are only about maybe half the size of Pluto. Uh, I think they used to be called the Plutinos or something like that. There were objects like that that were discovered earlier too. Uh, some of these Haumea, uh, Makemake, they are th those objects. And then um, it brings in the question of the Ceres, the largest of the asteroids that were discovered. Is that a planet? So, so you can see that once we add one, if we were to add Aries as a 10th planet, we probably wouldn't stop there. Ceres would have to be the 11th planet and Haumea and Makemake, both of which are actually bigger than Ceres. They would be, have to be 12th, 13th planet. And um, so nine planets is the only number of planets that we can't have because it, uh, it's the dividing line that um, where there's no clear cut. And if we go beyond the nine, then we probably would have ended with 20 planets by now. And that it seems a little bit, uh, it seems to devalue, not devalue, it seems to make less clear what a, what a planet is because all those additional planets that would have been added, they are nothing like the four terrestrial major planets or the four giant major planets. So, so that's where um, the International Astronomical Union decided to uh, set the boundary just uh, before Pluto so that um, the definition would be made so that Pluto and Eris are not planets. Instead, they are dwarf planets. And uh, we don't know the exact number of dwarf planets. You know, this is the this definition that has been uh, uh, voted on and decided by International Astronomical Union uh, that is um, that defines what uh, how future objects to be discovered will be uh, classified as dwarf planet A, B, and uh, A, B, and D are the uh, criteria that op apply to a planet, and C is what separates um, planet from dwarf planet. And um, and the objects that are illustrated in this figure are the definite um, um, uh, definite objects that belong in the dwarf planet category. But there may be more. They there may be uh, within the asteroid belt. Uh, Ceres is probably the only one. But as far as the trans-Neptunian objects goes, there could be still be a lot fairly large objects objects that are large enough to have uh, made, uh, <laughs> has sufficient mass for its self-gravity to overcome rigid body forces so that it assumes a hydrostatic equilibrium. Or, you know, something that looks roughly spherical. Um, there are maybe objects like that, uh, many more objects like that in the, uh, beyond the Neptune's orbit. So we don't know the exact number of dwarf planets, but what we do know through that 2006 red redefinition of planet is that um, 
the, we have the eight major planets and um, the future trans-Neptunian objects to be discovered that meet the criteria will be dwarf planets. And so, so that's uh, what I was running out of time on a Thursday and I wanted to have enough time to talk about. So I took the time out of this virtual class session to do that. Um, and I, I guess uh, why I wanted to spend the time on this uh, concept of uh, clearing the neighborhood is that um, th this is an aspect of gravitational interaction. And I hope as you uh, go through these modules, you see the importance of gra this uh, gravitational interaction highlighted. You see in a couple places, let me just highlight it so that you can, uh, so that there will be a reminder to you. <laughs> um, I think when we talk about rings, uh, I mentioned shepherd moons and the way shepherd moons affect the ring, it's through gravitational interaction. It, um, so you could almost say in some uh, kind of uh, microcosm kind of scale that uh, shepherd moons uh, clear the neighborhood <laughs> of its own orbit around the, the planet that it's orbiting, or it's gravitationally affecting the, the neighborhood around it so that they maintain the sharp features of a ring system. Saturn has some, some of the rings that are maintained by its shepherd moons. And in some module 3.4, you, you see the features that I was highlighting before. Um, in the asteroid belt, these features, the groupings of asteroids, uh, Trojans and Greeks, um, are maintained by Jupiter. Trojans and Greeks are at the Lagrange point of Jupiter and the Sun, and the Hildas are in an orbital resonance, uh, 2 to 3 resonance orbit with Jupiter. And um, I think uh, one of the theories or speculations around this asteroid belt, why we have an asteroid belt rather than uh, rather than a, a fifth terrestrial planet around here is the gravitational influence of Jupiter, that um, Jupiter um, was pulling and tugging on materials here enough that the material here could never come together to form a planet. Um, so that kind of uh, gravitational interaction is something that um, uh, you will see that's a recurring theme. Uh, in fact, if I do my job right up through module six, you will see the importance of gravity throughout uh, astronomical observations. So, so I want you to highlight that um, as an important key 